All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. My name is Victor Nieves. This is The Deep Dive, and today we're going to be talking about why I care so much about the transgender issue. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in politics. There's a lot of things that we could focus on, but I think that the transgender topic in specific is kind of the canary in the coal mine. It is a symbol of what is to come. And we're going to dive into exactly what that is. We're going to unpack the modern gender theory, the, the history of the transgender ideology, and then my refutation of it. For uh, anybody who's watching, this is the first time we're going to experiment with it. We'll see how this goes. Uh, but I am going to be recording this and posting it on Rumble and posting it on YouTube, kind of doing a video podcast for the first time. My apologies to anyone watching over there. I know it's not going to be like the most elite, super HD, amazing video quality, audio quality. We're working on it. Hey, if you like the program, if you like what we do and you think, you know what, I want to support that, well, get in touch with me. Maybe we can figure out a way to get better equipment, somebody who knows a thing or two about video and audio production. But anyways, jumping right in today, I, I want to start off by kind of giving an explanation of modern gender ideology and why I fully believe that if we allow this this continual spread and propagation of the transgender ideology, this narrative, I fully believe that our society will crumble and it will fall. Now, jumping into it, the WHO defines gender as, quote, characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. It's the belief of, of, of the WHO. It's the belief of many within the trans ideology that gender is not something that's metaphysical. It's not something that is biological. No, instead, gender is simply nothing more than this compilation of societal norms and gendered characteristics that have evolved throughout human, human I guess, human existence where men traditionally did certain roles because they were biologically wired to those certain roles because they had, for example, you know, more physical strength, greater bone density, etc., whereas women were more physically wired to do other things, care for children, they're naturally more empathetic, etc. The basic idea of the WHO is the basic idea of the transgender ideology, this concept that gender is nothing more than a societal construct. And because of that, many of them believe that you can simply pluck someone out of their societally assigned, air quotes, their societally assigned roles, drop them into the other one, and you'll see absolutely no adverse side effects, that those people will be completely fine. Now, we know that that's not the truth. We know that the more you observe the, the entirety of this ideology and practice, you see that depression, goes through the roof for individuals who have an incongruence between their, quote, biological sex and their assigned gender, or they have some sort of a difference between the two. You, you see suicide rates that are higher than any other group in human history, with the rare exception of literally paranoid schizophrenics. You see anxiety, you see depression, you see all sorts of adverse mental health problems. And it, it's not an insult on them as human beings. It's not an insult on their character. It's just an observation of the facts. We know that if somebody begins to live out a, quote, gender, which they believe to be different than their sex, which I, I suppose we have to get into that before we jump in any further, before we go head first into this, the rest of this conversation, what they would have you to believe, and this is a false idea, but what, would they, what they would have you to believe is that gender and sex are not the same. See, all throughout American history and history of, of the majority of people in the Western world, Gender and sex have been synonyms. Sex has typically been a little bit more formal. It's been used for like the application of government paperwork and stuff like that. Your driver's license will typically say sex, although there are definitely instances where gender has been used because it's a sentiment, synonym. It has been used on government paperwork, but most often we reserved sex for the slightly more formal application. And then, you know, gender you would use in more casual conversation. They would have you to believe that gender and sex are different, that sex is more your chromosomes, your biology, what, what your physical, your physiology would say that you are, whereas your gender, because remember, they think it's nothing more than a social construct, an aggregation of different societal habits and social norms, they would tell you that your gender is nothing more than some sort of a, an idea, some sort of a, a concept in your head that we associate with, with roles that are typically masculine and feminine. Again, it becomes very circular. How they define that is a whole nightmare. It's a whole can of worms. But rest assured, it's a whole big basket of stupid. If you, have, if you take nothing else out of this, gender theory is a big basket of stupid. Anyways... 
jumping right back in, where did we leave off here? I have, for anybody who's watching on the uh, on the video podcast of this, because I'm not used to this, I'm not used to doing video podcasts, I have notes. I have fairly diligent notes. Um, I'm going to try and make all of my sources available to anyone who wants to check any of this stuff. Uh, it's also publicly, you know, just do your own research. I'll put links in the description of the video, uh, the video uploads to YouTube and Rumble so that you can find all of this stuff. But I want to start off with a little bit of the history of the trans ideology and specifically what's been called the John slash Joan case. Some of you may be familiar with this, but involves a doctor by the, well, really a psychologist by the name of John William Money, and two patients that he had. You can find this entire thing in psychology textbooks. You can find this on Wikipedia if you want. You can find it all over the place, the John slash Joan study. It's one of the most disgusting, uh, heart-wrenching, jaw-dropping pieces of scientific, uh, philosophical garbage that you'll ever hear of in your entire life. So for a little bit of context, uh, this, this story goes back and it starts off with two twin boys. They were born in 1965. One of them was David. Uh, the other one, eventually he changed his name. I forget what he changed his name to, but uh, one boy's named David, the other boy's named X, for lack of, I just, I just did a poor job. <sighs> we'll cut that out. Will we? Is it even possible to cut that out? We're not going to cut that out. We're just <laughs> to anyone who's watching on the uh, on the video podcast of this, they're going to be so disappointed in me because I don't want to do that. I don't want to edit all of this stuff together. I just want to do it in one take. So we're going to do it in one take, whether it's quality or not. I, I forgot to write down the one kid's name, but you have two boys. They're born in 1965. David is the one that we're going to focus on. He had a botched circumcision. His, his doctor used a process called electrocauterization, which is not normally used in, in male circumcision. Essentially, they wanted to electrocute the young boy's foreskin off. He was like seven months old. They waited a long time. He had a different you know, medical problem. Either way, they were going to do this to both boys. They started off, they did it to David, and the electrocauterization process, again, there's a good reason it's not used very often, it basically burnt his penis off. It, it like completely destroyed his penis. Well, as a result of this, his parents were super, super worried about his longtime sexual fulfillment, whether he could find a partner. They thought he was going to have some serious long-term problems, as you can imagine, and I don't really blame them. I, frankly, I, I don't know what you do in that situation. It's absolutely terrible to have your penis electrocuted off. This is not something I would wish on my worst enemy, but his parents are worried, so they take him to a psychologist named John Money, as we mentioned earlier, a pioneer in sexual development and gender identity. Keep in mind, this is in the 1960s, early 1970s, that he would be their uh, caregiver or whatever you want to call it. So it was kind of early on. This is at the beginning, the onset, at least in the United States, in the West, of this modern gender theory. And he was a pioneer, John Money. They don't like to talk about this story, by the way, because it doesn't shine their gender ideology in a positive light. But this John Money, pioneer in sexual development, gender identity, and work with, quote, intersex patients, he believed, much like the WHO today, he believed that gender was nothing more than a social or societal construct, something that was socially learned, a behavior, and a behavior that could be change. So they decided, uh, the doctor and the parents, they decided that this poor young boy, David, who had had his penis essentially burnt to a crisp like Anakin Skywalker, they decided to give him a quote unquote vagina. Now his identical twin was left a male, which means that this was the perfect, part of the reason this is such a fascinating, although horrible story, is it was a perfect control. You had identical twins, which means genetically these two boys are literally as similar as two human beings can be, both born men. And at a very, very young age, before they could ever introduce them or before they had ever been introduced to the societal norms in a sense that they could understand, one of them has his tragically, tragically has his penis burnt to a crisp, and the other one does not. So you have one that now is given a vagina and lives the rest of his life as a woman, a girl, air quotes, named Brenda. The boys grow up, and they are subjected to some of the most awful, horrendous, disgusting, I don't, I don't know exactly what to call them besides torturous experiments by this Dr. Money, uh, this Dr. John William Money. 
He believed that he had to reinforce uh, with David, who then went by Brenda, the one who had had the artificial vagina installed, he believed that he had to reinforce essentially the, the female characteristics so as to raise poor young David, a.k.a. Brenda, as a girl... You might not believe exactly what happened, but he forced the two boys to... I don't want to get too graphic. I don't want to make this something that's not uh, family-friendly, I suppose, or something that shouldn't be viewed or listened to by, by younger people. Forced them to basically do sexual acts to each other. He wanted to, quote, reinforce reproductive behavior. He started that at age six. As the boys got a little bit older, um, eventually... There was no hiding from young David, who went by Brenda. There was no hiding from young David the fact that he was a boy. He started to figure this out. By the way, they dumped this kid full of hormones and etc. They, they tried to make it as convincing as humanly possible. But he was a boy. You can't change that. You can't change reality. And by about the age of 13, they started to figure this out. Well, tragically, the two brothers would both take their lives. One directly killed himself uh, at age 38. The other one died of a drug overdose at age 36. Modern gender theory in the United States has been taking lives since the 1960s. Where it was applied, it was a massive gargantuan failure, even though there was the perfect control. They took this young boy from a very, very young age, and they raised him as if he was a girl. They pumped him full of hormones. They gave him a fake vagina. They did everything that they possibly could so as to convince this young man that he was actually... A young lady. Now, of course, he would find that out. It would lead to his his tragic ending of his life. And that's basically where the story ends. They don't like to talk about the disgusting roots of this transgender ideology here in the United States. But interestingly enough, that entire study was predicated on the notion of the WHO, of most people in the world of transgender ideology. It was predicated on this notion that gender is nothing more than a societal construct, socially learned behaviors. That's what money thought. That's what the WHO still says today. In fact, that's what you'll find in many psychology textbooks in all, all over the world in college campuses. You'll still see that today. However, I don't want to move on without acknowledging that there is a secondary theory within the world of transgender ideology. This group, an alternative theory, says that transgenderism is biological. In fact, they cite the difference between the gendered brains. And this is something that has been studied outside of the world of transgenderism for quite some time now, the idea that men and women do have different, literally uh, different makeups of their brain. The, the structures are actually varying in sizes, uh, particularly the hippocampus. You can look into the hippocampus, you can look into other regions of the brain, but they are chemically, they are physiologically different, the male and female brains. And so this has led some people to theorize that transgender people, legitimately transgender people, there has to be some gatekeeping here, legitimately transgender people are those who have an incongruence between their sex and their brain. They'll say that, yes, your primary sexual characteristics may be that of a man, but your brain, the hippocampus, the different structures and chemicals within the brain, more closely resemble that that is average found in a woman. So therefore, you are transgender. They say that the compounds of your brain, the makeup of your brain, is a more accurate representation of what you really should have been that you were born into the wrong body. <laughs> this is not used very often. It's not used by very many people because something that's called neuroplasticity. The human brain is incredibly, incredibly malleable. And over our lives, every aspect, every part of our brain can change. We see this in people who have been um, prisoners of war, people who have been tortured, people who have been subjected to brainwashing. Even on a, on a, on a slightly lesser scale, we see this in people who have undergone hypnosis where the structures and the chemical makeups of the brain can respond to certain outside stimuli. And the reason that they don't like to, that, that the majority of people have not adopted this, even though it would seem to be a little bit more scientifically defensible than appealing to the abstract and the metaphysical of this gender ideology social construct crap, the reason that they haven't leaned into this is because it kind of necessitates, for one, the ability to cure transgenderism, because as I said, neuroplasticity is a very well-established fact of the human brain. You can change the structures of the brain, which means that if that's the case, if transgenderism is actually the result of an incongruency between the brain and the body, you can cure it. 
And they don't, they don't like that. They really, really don't like that. It also would necessitate, um, you know, if they say that this is something that happens from birth, which many of them are uncomfortable to do, but a lot of them will say they were born into the wrong body. That necessitates and presupposes the existence of infants that are transgender. Most people aren't ready for that yet. They're not willing to take that jump. Societally, our social norms still haven't fallen that far down the slippery slope. We're not quite ready to accept that as if it was fact. Anyways, let me see. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? To those of you who are, who are listening on the podcast, this is a slightly different structure. Ordinarily, I would edit out any sort of a break or any sort of me collecting my thoughts. But hey, maybe this will be a little bit more genuine. Anyways, very few people are willing to accept that because it, it, it necessitates some level of gatekeeping. It necessitates the potential ability to be cured. And if they don't, if they're not willing to say that infants are born transgender, then that necessitates that people become transgender, which refutes the concept that they were born that way. And if you can become transgender, again, we circle back to the cure idea where the transgenderism can be cured. And if there's a potential for a cure, that means that, uh, you know, transitional therapy, gender affirming care is not the, pro not the appropriate, uh, um, not the appropriate model of care because there's still a 40% attempted suicide rate, or in many cases, even after transge transgender surgery and transition, even in incredibly accepting societies like that of Sweden, uh, there was a 20 or 30 year long-term study conducted, the biggest of its kind conducted in Sweden. People who got the transgender surgery were still 20 times more likely to kill themselves than the average control population. They were also subject to all kinds of depression, anxiety, etc., now, the refutation on top of that that I would give to or the gendered brain idea is that the John slash Jones study resulted in suicide. Gender is rooted in biology, but it transcends biology. We are not limited just to what's going on inside of our brain. We know that we're much, much more. We're not simply a bunch of chemical reactions and neurons firing off like a program. We are more than that. We, we transcend our, our mere biology. At least that's the belief of me and basically every other spiritual person on the planet is that there's something metaphysical about the human existence. Biology is not the only thing that determines gender. When you try to manipulate the brain and you try to uh, alter it, when you try and take somebody who is born a male, like in the John Jones study, you try and convince them that they are a female and you go against that, for one, the biological, but for two, the metaphysical assignment of gender that is given by God Almighty. If we're being completely honest, that's what this is. God doesn't make mistakes. You are born a man or you are born a woman. And when we, when we try to alter that, when we try to mess with the brain, it causes severe, severe distress. That's where, again, we find the 40% attempted suicide rate. True gender, true sex are established and assigned by God Almighty. Now, I want to segue here and talk about the fact that we know for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, we know whenever we do meta-analysis, and for example, the one that was conducted that we mentioned earlier in Sweden, when we do a meta-analysis and we examine the scientific evidence surrounding the transgender subject, we know, like I said, it doesn't work. The so-called gender-affirming care idea is a whole crock of dog crap. It doesn't work. If you don't believe me, in 2016, the United States, in the United States, Obama's CMMS rejected so-called sex reassignment surgery for lack of evidence stating that its benefits to patients are non-existent. That was Obama's CMSS. On top of that, the NHS, the British NHS, no longer recommends any form of gender transition for children. We know the vast majority, up to 90% of all children who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria will simply grow out of it by the time they reach adulthood. We already mentioned the Swedish study, the 30-year study with post-op transition patients, 20 times more likely to kill themselves. On top of that, uh, we also have so many different studies that have been conducted by major universities. I'll, I'll link some sources so as not to just quote everybody for 20 minutes. I'll link some sources in the video material below. And for um, the podcast upload, I'll post those to locals. For anyone who's on locals, you'll be able to find them there. All of the different sources and the refutations of the so-called effectiveness of gender-affirming care. But rest assured, it does not work. Anyways, another thing that you'll hear sometimes is that transgenderism 
is it's natural. It's something that's been around, uh, around since the beginning of time. It's something that's been happening forever. You have the two spirit references to the Native Americans. You have, you know, different historical examples. And if you just go online and you search up that subject material, you try and find historical examples of transgenderism because they'll make this appeal as though it's a totally normal thing. It's been going on since the beginning of time. Therefore, we should have to accept it and pretend that it's totally normal and healthy. They'll they'll cite things like the Neolithic and Bronze Age drawings between 7000 BC and 17. 1800 BC, which were cave drawings of people with both breasts and penises. Now, that's not exactly a very difficult thing to refute. It could have been a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, 15-year-old joking around going, haha, wouldn't that be funny if somebody had boobs and a penis? It could also be that they were worshiping some sort of a very, 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 very rare instance of, of somebody who is intersex, which is less than 1% of the global population. If they would have encountered somebody like that in the year 7000 BC, it's entirely possible that they would have thought it was some sort of a deity, and they would have been like, wow, that's really cool, and drawn it on a cave. It doesn't exactly uh, establish that this was a normal behavior of average people, much less that it was accepted in the general society as something that should be normalized. There are also examples um, out of the Czech Republic, Prague, a man who was buried in female clothes. This is a another, wow, astonishing <laughs> discovery from the, chan the transgender uh, sciences, scientists and the archaeologists, they cite this as if it's evidence of transgenderism being normalized. It could have just been this man, right, in the Czech Republic who was buried in female clothes. It could have simply been that they were out of male clothes. Also, you're talking about the Czech Republic in the, like, the, the Neolithic era. Do you really think that you know for sure what clothes were assigned to what different sex? Like, oh yeah, the, the men only wear that, the women only wear How How many complete sets of clothing do you have? Did you find a couple of wardrobes to compare? It was like, oh, his side, her side closets. And it's like, oh yeah, this guy. Really, you think that that's compelling evidence that we should accept transgenderism and allow children to, top, to, to chop off their penises and prescribe them Lupron? I disagree. They also talk about ancient Greek androgynous priests and eunuchs priests who had cut off their testicles and then would perform things that were not typically the duties of a man. That's not exactly akin to a transgender person. That's a priest. That's somebody who was doing something that I think is a little bit weird. It was probably considered a little bit weird back in the day, considering the ancient Greeks also uh, thought it was interesting enough that they wrote about it. It was clearly something that was out of the ordinary. But no matter what, all sorts of mental illnesses have been observed and have been around since the beginning of time. It doesn't show... My apologies. Not going to edit that out. I had an alarm go off on my phone if you wonder what that was. Anyways, also, <laughs> I talk about professional. All sorts of mental illnesses have been around since the very beginning of time. That doesn't necessitate that those are not mental illnesses. For example, depression, bipolar, dissociative identity disorder. There, there have been an abundance of different mental illnesses that have been observed all throughout human history. If there were Neolithic or Bronze Age or etc., different ancient examples of transgender peoples, that doesn't necessitate that that's a normal behavior. It's just an observation of a recognized mental illness, which is still a recognized mental illness to this day in the DSM-5. Now, we have established what I believe a pretty, to be a pretty airtight refutation of the transgender ideology scientifically, giving some historical context. Now allow me to explain why I think that if we continue to allow the propagation of this narrative, it will be the inevitable unraveling and destruction of Western society. How, what a segue. How do we get to this? Okay. We know that this is nonsense. We know for all of you watching on the, the video of this, we know that all of this transgender ideology, this theory is absolute gobbledygook. We know that it is a mental illness, but what's being required of us, what is being demanded of you and I is that we go along with it as if it was not. We are being told that we have to spit in the face of basic biology. We have to spit in the face of thousands of years of Western understanding. We have to reject common sense, and we have to just go along headfirst and not just accept and tolerate, but celebrate and promote what we know to be insanity. And if we allow this precedent to be set, and if we allow our children to be the direct victims of this narrative, we allow children to be undergoing pro, you know, procedures like double mastectomies, hysterectomy surgeries, phyoplasties, and chemical hormone blockers, and chemical castration, physical castration. If we allow this to be propagated onto our children, and we allow generations of young people to grow up so confused that they think that a man can snip off his balls and suddenly he becomes a female, we have lost anything that even resembles having a grip on reality. 
We have thrown out our traditional understandings of God and morality, right and wrong, and we have allowed this transhumanistic approach no pun intended, it's a real thing, transhumanism. We've allowed this transhumanistic approach to replace what we've always understood to be a common understanding of right and wrong. If we don't stop this, what will we stop? That's my challenge to anyone who may disagree. I think that this will be the inevitable destruction of our society if we allow it to continue. If we, if we allow this to continue unfettered, unaltered, and we just pretend that this is something that's completely normal, we allow it to be foist upon generations of young children, they're going to grow up, so, grow up so wildly confused, they won't know what's real and what's not. There's a reason that they're going after kids and not adults. I mean, they want all of us to comply but they know we disagree. That's why they preach unto us tolerance. They say, well, you have to tolerate it. it. It may not be, you know, something you agree with, but it doesn't affect you. And by the way, that's a lie. They're focusing too much on the macro, not enough on the micro. Excuse me, I have that backward. They're focusing too much on the micro, not enough on the macro. What somebody does, even if they're not punching you in the face, it can affect you. For example, example, the macro destruction of your culture and your Western values. They say, oh, well, what does it matter if we normalize transgenderism? It doesn't directly harm you. Uh, yeah, but it harms my kids. It harms the culture and society and the world that I have to raise my children in. So it does actually affect me on the macro scale, maybe not the micro so much. It's not like I'm being directly punched in the mouth, but it definitely impacts me and definitely affects me on the, mac on the macro scale. Anyways, where did I leave off? I don't know anymore. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you guys like this. Um, I hope you guys like this format because normally I I'm allowed to like catch my breath for just a second. We've been covering an awful lot of stuff. Anyways, if we allow this to 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 really gain roots and we we allow this to become established and something that you're no longer allowed to question and actually you know to a greater extent something that you have to celebrate you have to promote you have to encourage it will be the unwinding of western society every single human being on the face of the earth knows that this is nonsense if you could actually put somebody on some sort of a test or you could give them some sort of a potion that that made it to where they are literally incapable of lying and you asked everybody out there if chopping off your penis made you a woman, every single one of them would say no. We know that this is a basic biological fact. There is no such thing as being transgender. It doesn't actually exist. You cannot transition your gender. You cannot, you cannot be a transsexual. It is physically impossible to change what you are. You cannot rewire your genetics. You can't rewire your chromosomes. And we all know this to be true. These kids, remember I said there's a reason they go after the kids. I remember where I left off now. They're going after the kids because they know that the adults know the truth. And they know that the kids also know the truth, but children can be convinced of all sorts of things. Children can be convinced of the existence of the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, you name it. Children believe in all kinds of stuff. And if you can get somebody while they're young, it seems an awful less preposterous to a child because they have such a vivid imagination. They can be convinced of all sorts of insanity. And if we allow that to happen, we have completely undermined reality so much so that I don't think we'll ever get back to it. So I rest my case. I'll make all of it's going to take a lot to, to put all the source material in here. I'll try and make all of my sources publicly available through the description of the YouTube and the Rumble videos. I'll make all of my sources available um, on somehow for the podcast, the audio only folks. I'll try and make it available uh, on Locals. If you haven't subscribed, uh, become a, subs a supporter, I should say, on Locals. Be sure that you do so. It helps make content like this possible. $3 a month, really not much. It's a McDonald's, uh, like a McChicken and a small fry, something like that. And if I give you as much value to your life and to the cause as a McChicken and a small fry, please consider doing that. We have zero corporate sponsorships. We have zero big business backers. I am literally 1,000% independent in all of the online content that I make, especially this kind of stuff. I don't think very many people want to like sponsor these things. Unless that's you, in which case, reach out to me. But uh, folks, that's all I have for today. Subscribe if you're on YouTube or Rumble. Uh, share this to other people. Share it if you're listening on podcast platforms. Until next time, keep me in your prayers. Keep your country in your prayers. Lord knows we need them. I will see you all next time.